In June, I, I'm going to begin a series on experiencing the Father's heart. Experiencing the love of the Father. Because that is where we find our identity as sons and, and daughters. And, and, and letting God break that, that orphan spirit, that, that orphan mindset off of us. So that we begin to step into who we really are. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. I've been telling my discipleship groups that I've been meditating on this passage in Romans for weeks now. It says that, that all of creation is travailing and groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. That they're, it's waiting for sons and daughters to recognize who they are through experiencing the love of the Father and beginning to live like sons and daughters of God. And, you know, when I first started reading that, I, I, I had a kind of a wrong perspective on it. I thought, well, the world's waiting, they're waiting for us to show up. But I, I realize now that it's not about us. It takes a son to reveal the Father. They're actually waiting for the Father. They're actually waiting for the love of the Father and the revelation that comes through a son. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, but I, I want to finish this series. We've been talking about pride and rebellion. Isn't that, isn't that been fun? <laughs> isn't, isn't it a great thing to talk about pride and rebellion? And how God uses authorities in our lives to expose our pride, to expose our rebellion, because he wants us to walk in humility. That's where the power is. That's where the kingdom will manifest in your life. When you humble yourself before God. And we have to humble, humble ourselves before man too. And, and when we do, his grace empowers us to live for him. For God resists the proud. He sets himself against the proud. But he pours out his grace. He gives grace to the humble. Pride will close doors that, 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 that God opens in your life. Pride will close those doors, whereas humility will open them. Humility will open doors that aren't even open yet. But when you humble yourself, you are inviting the activity of heaven in your life. You're inviting the grace of God to be just poured out in your life. How many of you know we need God's grace? I used to think God's grace just meant... Oh, you know, he's going to forgive me for all the stuff I did. But I didn't realize that his grace is actually what empowers me. Amen. It's more than just uh, un unmerited favor, but it is actually the, the power of God that enables me to live for him. So I, to begin with today, I want to tell a story, a Bible story. A true story from the Bible out of the book of Daniel chapter 4. And it's about this king who was, uh, he, he was in, a, in a place where he had, he was the greatest king in all the earth. He had the most influence of any king. In fact, pretty much the known world was under his influence. And his name was Nebuchadnezzar. And the thing about Nebuchadnezzar was that he... Uh, he had this, these Hebrew guys that worked for him. And one of them, his name was Daniel. And Daniel was this guy, he was a Hebrew. He was a Jew. But he worked for this pagan king, and he worked for him as if he was working for God. He worked for him with excellence and diligence. And because of that, he kept rising up in this kingdom. In fact, the, 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 the native people were pretty upset about this Hebrew guy that kept coming into greater influence. But Daniel was a man of God, and he knew God. He had a relationship with God, and he was known to be able to interpret dreams. And Nebuchadnezzar had this, this dream that, that, that really bothered him. In fact, that's not the right way to say it. It scared him. It scared him. And so he shared his dream with Daniel, and, and Daniel interpreted it for him. And in essence, it was this. Um, you have been given... All the authority and influence in the earth, that has been given to you by God. 
And you need to humble yourself and, and acknowledge God as the source of all of that. And if you don't do that, God is going to judge you for your pride and your iniquity. And so about a year later, Nebuchadnezzar is walking through his palace. You know, it's probably this, a beautiful palace. He's walking through here, and, and he begins to think, and he begins to say, you know, is not this the great Babylon that I have built by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And before he could even get those words Fully out of his mouth, God judged him. And he found himself living for the next seven years in the wilderness. How many know seven years is a long time to eat grass? I prefer going to supper church because they have pizza and all kinds of good stuff. But, but for seven years, it's, it's like he lost everything, and he's, he's living like a wild animal. He's eating grass like oxen. His hair's grown long, and it's so matted, it looks like eagle feathers. His, his fingernails are grown out like bird claws, and for seven years, he lives like that. Not my idea of a good time. <laughs> and so... At the end of those seven years, it, it, it's like he came to his senses, and all of a sudden he looked up towards the heavens, and he acknowledged God. And he said, God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and an enduring kingdom. And he recognized, he gave honor to God. He humbled himself before God. And God restored his kingdom to him. Only he's a little bit different guy now. He's got a different perspective now. In fact, his last recorded words, Nebuchadnezzar's last recorded words are this. Those who walk in pride, God is able to put down. <laughs> That's the kind of summation of, of what, what he came up with in passing his wisdom on. He knew by first-hand experience that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Pride is your enemy. It will keep you from the abundant life. It will cause doors of opportunity that God opens to close. It will cause you to live in a dry place. And it will be your choice by choosing not to deal with pride in your own heart. Psalm 68 verse 5. This is a description of what God is like. He is a father of the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy habitation. If you are fatherless, if you don't have a father in your life, maybe you, your father abandoned you. Or maybe your father abused you. Or maybe your father just wasn't there. He was, he was aloof. I've got really good news for you. God says, I'll be your dad. And he's this amazing dad. He, he's just incredible. And he's a defender of widows. That's what God is like in his holy habitation. That's what he does. He, that's what he spends his time doing. Being a father to the fatherless. And a defender of widows. Wow. God sets the solitary in families. If you feel kind of alone in life, if you feel like, man, I, I just, I'm walking through life alone. The Bible says that God will set you in a family. And that's really what a church is. A church is a spiritual family. And you won't be alone anymore. You'll have people walking with you. You'll have people that love you. You'll have people that will do life with you and walk through things. Because that's what God is like. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. If you're in bondage, if you let him, God will bring you into abundance. But notice the next seven words. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Man, that just ruined the whole mood of that verse for me. 
I was really liking this. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, takes lonely people and puts them in a family and, and, and describes uh, bringing the, those that are bound into abundance. And, and all of a sudden, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. or the, the old King James says a parched land. If you choose rebellion, which is the fruit of pride... If you choose rebellion, and God will let you. It's not what he wants for you. In fact, it, it breaks his heart. But if you choose rebellion, you will live in a parched land. What is rebellion? It's refusing, first of all, to acknowledge the authority of God like Nebuchadnezzar. But it's also refusing to acknowledge the authorities that God places in your life. It's being in that place where I refuse to let anyone speak into my life. Don't tell me what to do. All kingdom issues are heart issues. Everything that matters is about the heart. It has to do with our heart. I don't know about you, but, but I don't want to live in a dry place because of certain choices that I have made in my heart. I don't want to live in a parched place because of my pride. Now, I realize I'm reviewing a little bit, but, but I need to do this. In your notes, how are pride and rebellion expressed? Just like this. Don't tell me what to do. Who do you think you are? Don't tell me how to dress. Don't tell me how to live my life. Don't tell me what to do. You're not my boss. I will dress like I want to dress. I will act like I want to act. I will do what I want to do. Rebelliousness resists authority and it is born out of pride. It is a product. It is a child of pride. Pride is what gives birth to rebellion. Now the Bible talks about four areas of authority that God places in our lives. And God uses each of these areas of authority to shape our life and to actually build into us the character that we need to carry the anointing that he wants to put on our lives. God uses these authorities to prepare us for the future. And see, pride and rebellion will cause me to thwart the very destiny and purpose that God, that God has for my life. You know, I, I discovered as a young Christian that the times that I grew, the times that I actually changed, were the times that I was challenged by an authority in my life, and I didn't like it. They challenged me to do something that I didn't want to do, but when I humbled myself and did it anyway, that's when I realized I was growing. That's when I realized that God was exposing things in my heart so that he could deal with those things and take away those things that would stop me from moving into the things that God has for me. Does that make sense? They, they were things that would cause my life to stagnate if I didn't deal with them. They would cause me to just get stuck. Have you ever been stuck in life? Have you ever been in a place where you're just stuck? You're not moving forward, you're not moving backward, and you're just thinking, I just, I don't like to be here. This is not where I want to live. This is not where I want to be. I began to see that these authorities in my life, when they challenged me to do something that I didn't want to do, that was when God exposed with exposed and dealt with my arrogance. Pride and rebellion work together to keep us in a dry place. They will keep us in a parched land and it's not what God wants. Now the first area of authority that we see in scripture is this. Number one, family. La familia. It is the first authority structure that we find ourselves in, that we experience in life. And we're placed under the authority of our parents. They may be great parents, they may be not so great parents. And it's, it's not really about that. It's about how my heart responds to this authority that God places in my life. This is the first place that pride and rebellion will show up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
No pointing. But if I can recognize it when I'm young, and if I can let God deal with it when I'm young, it will save me lots of problems. It will save me lots of difficulty as I grow older. It will keep me from living in a parched land. Colossians 3.20 Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. But if we don't allow those things to be dealt with when we're young, we're going to have a rough time when, we're, when we get older. In fact, we're going to discover that we have a hard time doing relationships. In fact, there will be a series of broken relationships in our lives. We probably will have a hard time holding down a job because no one wants to put up with our pride. No one wants to put up with our rebelliousness, our inability to be taught, our inability to receive instruction. If I don't deal with these hard issues, I'm going to find myself living in a dry place. And I'm probably going to be blaming everyone else around me. You know, my, my dad... You know my dad? <laughs> that teacher? Oh, what a jerk. You, th that boss of mine? We'll, we'll be pointing the finger just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. You know when they sinned, they didn't want to embrace their own stuff, did they? So God says, Adam, what's going on here? Adam says, it was that woman you gave me. This is your fault, God. If, if you hadn't given me that woman, we'd be fine. And, and then he talks to the woman. He says, what's this? And the woman says, it was that serpent. That, that serpent came in here and deceived me. Why, why did you let that serpent come in the garden anyway? See, we, we, we love to blame shift. We love to say, you know what my problem is? You. We love to do that. That husband of mine, that wife of mine, my boss, we love to do that. Do you know what my problem is? Well, here's the thing. It's probably right here. And see, when, when a person refuses to deal with those things, when a, when a person is in that place where they're not teachable, they're not instructable, things are falling apart all around them, and they're blaming everybody around them, when all the time, it's right here. Whew. But nobody likes to do that. Nobody likes to say, you know what my problem is? You don't see that very often, do you? You know, that's why in Celebrate Recovery and, and all kinds of things that God is using, there, there, there's something about taking ownership. I've got to own my stuff. I can hear my wife saying that too. <laughs> You've got to own your stuff. That, no, nothing changes until you own your stuff. Until you deal with your own hard issues. Humility is good. Pride is not good. Okay, bad. That works. Bad. <laughs> In your notes, the way we deal with pride and rebellion is by humbling ourselves in whatever situation we're in. That it's always the answer. And it, it's, it always works. And that's how we live in the kingdom. That's how we operate in the kingdom. Humility will always yield good fruit. God places authority structures in our lives so that we can see our pride and, and our rebelliousness. It's like this melting pot. You know, when you want to purify gold or purify silver, you, you heat it up. And what happens is all the impurities rise to the surface and then the refiner can scoop off those impurities and then you've got purified silver or purified gold. God puts you in situations, authority structures that causes your life to heat up in such a way that your pride, your rebellion surfaces. And then it's your choice as to whether to turn 
your eyes to the refiner and say, Are you to me, Senor? I really need some help here, Lord. Lord, come, I recognize my pride. I recognize my rebellion. Come, holy refiner, and, and scoop those things off of my life that I might be purified. That's what authority is designed to do in our lives. To cause those impurities to surface. To expose pride and rebellion. God places those authorities in our lives because he loves us and he wants us to do well. He wants us to live the abundant life, not in a dry land. And he knows that if those things are left unchecked, they are going to be a detriment. They are going to stop me from moving forward in my life. They will cause me to stagnate, to get stuck. So he creates environments to expose those things. The second area of authority that the Bible speaks of is, number two, government. You know, I begin this series by, by saying this. This is what I wish somebody would have sat me down and told me when I first became a Christian. It would have saved me some problems. If I really realized what God was up to in my life, I would have cooperated a little bit better. I would have recognized that when my pride welled up, it wasn't so that I could say some choice words. It wasn't so that I could do some choice things. But rather, so that those things can be dealt with in my heart and life. Paul was talking to the Christians in Rome. And, and, and it's so interesting because we're not talking about a Christian culture. We're talking about an anti-Christian culture. We're talking about living under a, the dictatorship of Caesar. And Paul said this, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. I may have forgot to put that in the notes. It, it's Romans 13 verses 1 and 2. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist the ordinance or, uh, will resist will bring judgment on themselves. Wait a minute, Paul. We're talking about a dictatorship. We're talking about an anti-Christian culture. What in the world are you talking about? And yet, he's saying... There's no government, there's no authority that God doesn't allow. And if you, find, if you position yourself to resist it, you end up actually resisting God. Whoa. Peter said it this way, the Apostle Peter said it this way, 1 Peter 2 verse 13. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God. You're kidding me. <laughs> that by doing good, you may put the, to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Give to honor and, and give respect to whom it is due. Render to Caesar to the things that are Caesar's, but render to God the things that belong to him. Subject yourself to the king, whether he knows God or not. That's not what this is about. He says, submit to that authority, for this is the will of God. Don't take parts of the Bible that you like and ignore parts of the Bible that you don't like. If you're going to profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ, this is his book. This is his book. Embrace the whole counsel of God for your own sake. For, to, to position yourself to receive a constant flow of His grace flowing into your life. So that you can experience life more abundant. Now the third area of authority that God places in our lives is the church. And you know as a young Christian, <laughs> I had trouble with all of these, okay? As a young Christian... This one made the most sense to me. That God would actually use the church as an authority in my life. I was, I was the most okay with that authority. But I'll tell you, it still became a place of challenge for me. I, I, I realized 
That, that how I responded to those in authority, even in the church, would determine whether I grew in God or not. Because occasionally my pastor or maybe another church leader would challenge something in my life. Challenge my attitude. And inside I'm thinking, who do you think you are? Or they would challenge how I, was, how I was living or maybe how I was treating other Christians. And you know, here's the truth. Like this is the first time I've, I've ever said it out loud, okay? Here's the truth. Every time they challenged me, I knew they were right. I just didn't like being challenged. Every time they challenged me, I knew they were right. There was the ring of truth. It's just, it hurt my pride. Humility is good. Pride is bad. Not good. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 17. Obey those who rule over you. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give an account, for let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. <coughs> so the writer of Hebrews says this, be submissive and obedient to your spiritual leaders because they're actually watching out for your souls. They, they really want what's best for you. They don't enjoy challenging you, but they love you too much not to. When they see something in your life that's going to hurt you in the future, they love you too much not to talk to you about it. Do you know the reason that we discipline our children? It's not because they, oh, I'm just ticked at my kid, I'm going to spank him. It's not that. You see something in them, something in their heart, a rebelliousness or something, and you just think, man, you know, I, we, that needs to be dealt with. Or when they get older, they could really get in trouble. That's why we discipline. That's why God disciplines us. And, and these spiritual leaders will one day stand before God and give an account as a shepherd how they took care of the flock. How they cared for each member of that congregation. Did they speak the truth in love? The fourth area of authority that God really used in my life, this was the hardest, okay? All of them were tough. Like, I, like, you know, my parents were great, but I, I hit a certain age where I didn't think they knew anything. I, I hit a certain age where I, I thought, you know, they really don't know what life is about. They don't know anything that's relevant. Now, the older I got after that, the more I realized how smart they were. You start out at four or five, and, and, and your dad knows everything. In fact, my dad could beat up your dad. And then you hit a certain age where you think, man, they don't know anything. But then it, it comes back. As you get older, you realize, wow, just how smart they were. Now I realized why they said that. Now I realize what they were thinking. That area challenged me. Government, oh man. I really struggled with that. I struggled with authority on that level. And I struggled in the church too. When people would, would, would bring correction to my life. Because I didn't want to hear it. Because I was Dave Christian. But the truth was, every time they said something, I knew it was right. But my pride didn't want to hear it. Now the fourth area is business. And really what I mean by this is employer-employee relationship. This was the area that God really challenged me in. There were so many times when I, I, I just wanted to say, I quit. I'm out of here. Take this job. <clears throat> you know, I, I had some interesting bosses through the years. But, but I did have this going for me. I never considered not working an option. That, 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 that was never an option in my thinking, so it forced me to work through the things that were in my heart. I knew that I needed to provide for my family, and I knew that I needed to do, to do whatever it took to do that. 
No matter how uncomfortable or how difficult it became, I knew that the proper and the right and the godly thing to do was to provide for them. And I'm so thankful that, that because I didn't have quitting as an option, it, it forced me to hang in there. It forced me to deal with things because pride and rebellion really showed up here. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I had a couple bosses through the years that were particularly challenging. They, they required of me things that I didn't feel was fair. Now, I, I, I'm not talking about, I'm not, like if a boss would have said, okay, I want you to be dishonest or I want you to lie, I, I wouldn't have done that. That's not what I'm talking about. Or if they would have asked me to do something that the Bible calls sin, no way. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about where I just didn't feel like it was fair. Or they were requiring more of me than they were requiring of somebody else. And, and here's the interesting thing. It didn't seem fair, but now as I look back on it, that's exactly what I needed to grow. That's exactly what I needed to expose things in my heart. To see what I needed to invite God to come and help me with. In my first 20 years in the workforce, I couldn't grow a beard. I was not allowed to grow a beard. And I was at that age where I wanted to display my manhood. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That there's just a certain age where you want to display your manhood. Like, yes, I can grow a beard. I couldn't. They wouldn't let me. Now, I, ha I had a mustache all that time. And there was even a season where I, I had some pretty long sideburns. But, but I was not allowed to grow a beard. In fact, there was a lot of restrictions. Well, Pastor Dave, you put up with that? Yeah, I did because I, I needed to provide for my family. I, I put up with that because I needed to put a roof over their head. I needed to put food on the table. I had to dress a certain way. I recognized that that was an authority God put in my life. When I started working for Frito-Lay, I couldn't wear jeans like I wear right now. I had to wear dress slacks, I had to wear a button-up shirt and a tie nine months out of the year. Now three months out of the year, in the, in the summertime we could wear these button-down polo type shirts and, and not wear a tie, but other than that, man, we, we wore ties. You would have thought I liked ties. <laughs> At the time I felt like whoever invented the tie should be strung up with one. But I did what I needed to do to work. Well, Pastor Dave, when you went to work for Frito-Lay, man, you're just driving around. You, you were your own boss. I bet that was so cool. I remember when I applied for the job, I was kind of thinking like that. Oh, man, this is going to be so cool. I'll just drive around in my truck. Finally, I'll be rolling in the chips. But I discovered that I had a boss that would come down at least every month and ride my route with me, called me two or three times a week to check on me and hold me accountable in what I'm doing in every store, and I discovered I had a boss in every store. <laughs> Can you imagine? I didn't, I didn't minimize, I didn't, well now I don't have a boss, now I've got 80 bosses. Jeez. I had one boss who was a, a grocery store manager that was particularly difficult. And one time, it was summertime, and, and Sarah was riding the route with me. And, and sometimes that's what we would do. She would come out, you know, and she'd just run the route with me. She'd, she'd have to get up early in the morning to do that. And we were out, we were in a store in Milton Freewater, and we went into the store, and, and I had this little computer typing in UPC numbers, and I'm writing the order, and we come back out in the truck, I plug it in, I'm starting to pull my order, the manager of the store steps into the truck, and he says, you cannot bring your daughter in here. And I said, why? He said, it's, it's an insurance issue. If she gets hurt, our insurance wouldn't cover it, she has to stay in the truck. 
I said, okay. Do you, do you, do you want to know what I wanted to say? I pulled that order, I went into that store, I, I probably have never put product on the shelf so fast. It's summertime, I have a metal truck, it's probably 110 degrees in that truck. And I'm so thankful I didn't run into him in the store then. Do you ever find yourself in a place where you might say something you shouldn't say and you're thankful you didn't get the opportunity to say it? I wanted to say, you are a jerk. How many know that might not have been helpful for my job? I didn't see him. I, I pulled the order and I, I stocked it, came back in the truck, we went on. No other store ever did that. They were always excited to see my daughter. Do you know what I mean? This particular manager, he, he was hard to work with by all of the route drivers. And uh, one, one week, he's particularly hard to work with. In fact, I can tell he's ticked with me. He's ticked. That was on Monday. I get there on Tuesday. You know, I mean, he, he was not an easy guy to work with anyway, but he is ticked with me. That's Wednesday. So Friday, I'm driving to Mill Freewater. I'm thinking, you know, I need to go talk to him. I'm going to have to humble myself. I'm going to have to find out what's wrong. I'm praying in the Spirit. I'm driving over to Milton Free Water. Just praying in the Spirit, saying, Lord, help me. I know how I want to react, but I know that's not kingdom. And I know what kingdom is. It involves humbling myself. And so I, I got to the store and I, I said, well, where's Perry? And he's, they said, well, he's up in his office. And so I... I went up in his office and I, I knocked on the door. I said, hi, Perry. He said, huh. You know, just kind of gruff. And I said, uh, I, I, I just want to say to you, I'm sorry. I don't know what I've done, but I have off, obviously done something to offend you. And I, I don't even know what it is, but I am so sorry. What did I do? He said, do you remember the week before on Wednesday when you wanted to build that display of Lay's Potato Chips? They had Lay's Potato Chips on sale and I needed to build an end display in order for them to have enough product to get through the weekend. And I said, yeah. He said, you remember I was in the check stand checking out a customer when you were talking to me. I said, yeah. He said, you caused me to do a $300 overring on that customer. And I said, Perry, I, he was right. Do you know that? I shouldn't have been talking to him while he's trying to check out a customer. I said, Perry, I am so sorry. I give you my word. I will never, ever talk to you when you're in a check stand. I'll wait till you get out. Please forgive me for doing that. He said, okay. We were friends. Now, he, he was still Perry. He, he was still, but, 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 but that, he, we were so much better. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't like that look of going in the store and the, guy, the manager looks like he wants to kill you. I, I just don't like that. There's something about humbling ourselves that positions us for the kingdom. Positions us for his grace. You know, I've had a lot of imperfect bosses through the years. I don't know about you. I, I you know, that, that have done things that have not seemed fair at times. But, but I'll tell you what, I can look back on it now and I can say I know exactly what God was up to. I know exactly what he was doing in my life. Now, I, I want to share a scripture and the reason I'm sharing a scripture about servants and masters is this. When, when you hire yourself out to an employee or to an employer, you are, you are giving your time, energy, and ability during a certain time slot for a certain amount of money. 
You do not belong to yourself. Your time, your ability belongs to that employer or belongs to that company during those certain hours for that particular wage. And that's why I'm using this. Colossians 3 verse 22. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. N not with eye service. Don't just work hard when they're looking at you. But when you work, don't just do it to try to please men, but, but please the Lord. Obey them like you would obey the Lord, as if Jesus was your boss. And do whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Serve that boss with the same wholeheartedness that you would serve God. If God asked you to do something, would you do it? Even if it was something you didn't want to do? Even if maybe it didn't seem fair, if Jesus asked you to do something, would you do it? I would. And as I realized that this was God's ordained authority in my life, I realized that God was using that authority to, to test my heart, to expose the things that needed to be exposed. And, and, and as I began to recognize that I can serve that boss as if, as if I'm serving the Lord. I can serve them wholeheartedly as if I'm serving God himself. Knowing that the Lord, from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. If you serve your boss as if you're serving the Lord, you will not only receive reward and favor from your boss, but you will receive it from God. And your life will thrive and prosper. But here's the thing. Humility is a choice. It is a heart quality that heaven looks for in order to bless, in order to pour grace upon. There, there are times in my life where my pride caused me to make wrong choices. Anybody else here? Or to say things that I shouldn't have said. And, and those wrong choices or those things that I've said have, have hurt relationships that I've had. But here's the thing. I've had to go back to those relationships. I've had to go back into those situations and apologize. I've had to go back and humble my heart and say, listen, I, I was out of line. What I said, that was a reaction. That's not me. That's not how I feel really. Please forgive me. There, there's something about humility that opens stars. There's something about humility that, that grace, when you humble yourself, let's say your boss is asking you to do something, it doesn't seem fair. But you humble yourself, and it's like grace comes in your life to enable you to do it with ease. It was hard when my pride was flaring, but when, when I humble myself, his grace just comes into my life and empowers me. All kingdom issues are heart issues. Pride is a heart issue. Humility is a heart issue. Do you want to have heaven's attention? Do you want to have God's ear when you pray? It's really very simple. Walk in humility. And you will have God's favor and God's blessing. And it will be not just expressed from heaven, but it will be expressed through the earth. He will be perpetually pouring out his grace upon you. Have, have, I, have I shared enough scripture to convince you about what I'm talking about? I, I've got more, but I'm not going to share them. There, there, there's something about pride that positions us to where God actually sets himself to oppose us. Now let me tell you, you don't want God opposing you. You're going to be like opposed. But when you humble yourself, when you walk in humility, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. See, if you exalt yourself, you're going to experience a humbling. But if you humble yourself, God himself will pour into your life and begin to exalt you. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord.
You know, when you, when, you, when you recognize what God is up to, it becomes so easy to cooperate with him. When I recognize that, that God has placed people in my life that, that <clears throat> rub me the wrong way. When I realize that God has placed people in my life that, 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 that seem to provoke something within me, I realize now, thank you, God. You're exposing things in my heart and my life. Lord, I want to be in a place where, where I don't have any buttons. Nobody can push my buttons because I'm just walking in humility. You can even say something offensive to me. It's not, it doesn't bother me because, you know, I'm, I'm drawing my sense of well-being. I'm drawing, drawing my sense of identity from the Father. Thank you, Lord. Can we have the worship team come up? I, you know, that last song that you guys did is such a powerful song. And, and I, I would just like to close this morning. And it is still this morning. I just want you to notice that. Check your watches. You're going to get out of here on time. Can we put our hands on our hearts? Father, I just pray for, I pray for myself. I pray for everyone else here this morning. Lord, we, are, we know that it's all about the heart. We know that all kingdom issues are heart issues. And so, Lord, today we lay our hearts bare before you. And we give you permission to expose the things that need to be exposed. Lord, that you can heal us. That you can make us whole. That you can do the work in us that you're doing. We are being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. You are transforming us. You are changing us. And Lord, we just, we just position ourselves to cooperate with you. In Jesus' name.
Lord. I want to invite the worship team to come. I'm sorry, the, the prayer team. Worship team, stay where you are. Just stay right here. Prayer team, come forward just to be available to pray with people this morning. The benediction I want to give you is out of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. God bless you, saints. Have a wonderful week in his presence.